What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Cuesta Show. How is everybody doing out there on this Friday, February 2nd of 2024 for episode 108? So we finally did the impossible. We got rid of David. I mean, it's it's a good day. It's always a good day when David's not around. But no, no David is uh, finding himself. He, he decided to go over to Stonehenge and sit in the middle and see if he could find himself. I don't know. He's going through some existential crisis. But no, he'll be back at some point, maybe. Um, we'll see if I let him back. We might actually have a good show today for once without him. So <laughs> it's going to be good. But um, so if you like what you hear today, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five star, Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials at the Alex Cuesta show. Just want to quickly jump on last week's show. We had an awesome show. We talked to um, comedian Dave Landau, host of Normal World. You can find it on YouTube and Blaze TV and talk all things comedy. Um, talked about, you know, Norm MacDonald and his show and his opinion on stand up and things right now. So it was a great show. Easily one of the funniest shows because he's a funny guy and David and I just try. So it was good. Go ahead and give it a listen. But I'm jumping right in because I got a lot to talk about to this week's guest. Someone that if you've been listening to this show or any of my shows from the past is someone that, I, you know, I consider a good friend now. And um, has jumped on whenever I needed him, even though he's a busy, busy man to keep, you know, to use his phrases. He is busy. He is Brandon Scoopy Robinson, NBA insider and host of the Scoopy Radio podcast. What's going on, brother? No, the man, the Timberwolves are busy, not me. Thank you for having me as always. Always, of course, it's always a good time to have you, but you are a man that moves all around, always doing your thing. Um, You know, you're still you're still slowly coming out of retirement. So, you know, I, we got to, we got to <laughs> treat you a little bit. We got to, you know, walk you through some things, but um, you know, whenever you're on, we talk all things NBA because you are the man, the myth. And for those of you that don't know about scoop yet, you better find out because he has things that your favorite insider tells you in about a few hours after he already puts it out. <laughs> so um, I want to jump right in. I want to get your opinion. This year we had the first ever NBA in season tournament. Now, I am used to in-season tournaments because I like soccer. So all the major soccer leagues have their little cups in the middle. I thought it was cool that the NBA implemented it. I thought it could be something fun. Overall, grand scheme, what was your opinion of the in-season tournament this year? I was indifferent and I hated it at the same time. Oh, why'd you hate it? Let me hear it. Um, I didn't like the courts. But from from a from a basketball perspective, I don't care if it's high school, if it's grade school, if it's women, if it's older, older people at the YMCA. I, I like the game of basketball, but I think um, I, I, I knew what the I knew what the, the the overall thing was. Right. So ultimately, the league is looking to expand their television partners, their streaming and networks and get that billion dollar ticket and so um and this is stuff that i've i've heard from from league executives where this was really a case study on or this was quali quantitative data that you can present to the apple tvs that you can present to the amazons that you can present to netflix that you can present to, uh, represent to re you know what i'm saying that, it, that data and you, yeah yeah you to, to partners that you already have so the the, the best way to, to make that happen is having lebron who who outright the lakers won oh yeah um and got to that point you you showcase a a lebron and and the los angeles lakers against a young team and you know the, the pacers and tyrese halliburton and the numbers were off the roof so i i get it from that perspective that doesn't mean i have to like it um, I, I'll tell you this, a, a, a high ranking executive back in December asked me, Scoot, what did you think of the tournament? And I said, I thought it was corny. And they looked at me like for real because they respected my honesty. But what I just told you was their rebuttal. And I said, I get it from that perspective. Um, but I, I also feel like that level of um, rebuff that I had um, was the kind of uh, criticism that people had about the play in tournament. And now you look at the play in tournament and people look forward to it because that's that space in between when the regular season is over. Yep. And then you get to see the showcase of young talent that you may only get to see during the rising stars game. So it's like a second reprisal of that. So with all of that being said, I don't have to like it, but 
the NBA is expanding and I don't see it slowing down and nothing, nothing stays the same. So uh, I would say to look, keep looking forward to it, but the, the, the courts, they got to tweak some. See, I think the courts, as much as I didn't like them either, it was a smart first move, right? Because what was everybody talking about? They were talking about the play and tournament because they were talking about the courts. The court. but then you were looking to see how ugly these courts were, but then you were watching basketball. So the viewership definitely came to see how gross these courts were. Sure. Now, um, you know, when you watched it, I thought from watching it that when the, you know, the round robin stuff was going on in the beginning, it was just a regular season game, right? The guys were playing. As the rounds got more, the guys wanted it. Like, it wasn't something that they were kind of dogging through. It looked like, you know, maybe some teams that were already higher in the rankings and stuff were maybe not going as crazy. Like, obviously, you want to win every game. It counts towards a regular season. But, I, you mean, that championship game, that was a high level game. The Lakers and the Pacers both wanted it. They it wanted that championship. It was. I mean, yeah, it was. And the, the incentive for the half a million dollars isn't shabby either. Yep. Um, I, I'll also add that those games that they played were during the first quarter of the year that in some people's mind were meaningless. It actually gave you incentive or something to play for. Yeah. But also um, the NBA filled that in well, because you think about it, it started when the season started in October. Like it was like the first or second Thursday or Friday of the season. Right. And then you carry that over into spaces at or around Thanksgiving. Yeah. So you have football in the Turkey day there, and then you have basketball. So it's like, it made sense because it gave the Black Friday shoppers who may have shopped all day and then came home something to watch. Um, I think it filled in those time slots immaculately, immaculately, excuse me, from yep. from Halloween to, to Thanksgiving. And it's interesting because you would think this is not anything anyone has said. This is my opinion. You would think that because the NBA was so meticulous about scheduling this during the first quarter of a season. Imagine if basically, hypothetically, somebody around the league said to a player, hey, if y'all play all these games and you chill out, once we get the in-season tournament done, y'all can low manage as much strategically as you want. To me, that would make plausible sense. I don't have any, any proof of that, but that would make sense if you think about it because we weren't talking about people load managing. We were talking about how much players were playing. Yeah. And now you're seeing the load management, the Joel and Bede situation where, you know, to. right, right before all that. So yeah, yeah. it's just something that as I had some free time, I was thinking about one and one does equal two, if you ask me. Yeah, it certainly does. Now, in terms of the scheduling, it as it got towards the later rounds, as you got to like the semifinals and stuff, there was, you know, they gave slots where those were the only few games on, maybe a few games sprinkled here and there in that championship game. From people you talked to, what was it like the scheduling there? Because then they were also trying to sprinkle in the games for the teams that weren't in anymore so that the regular season kind of stayed semi-even-ish. Um, what was that like? Was that kind of a logistical nightmare for some of the teams when they were being told in a few days, like, hey, you got to go here and play here to fill in games? How was that? Well, I'll tell you this. So I'll, I'll start from like the summer when I was having conversations with current players um, in summer league about like about the end season tournament. I remember hearing about the end season tournament. I'm sitting on a plane. Um, I'm sitting in front of Brevin Knight, who uh, is the broadcaster for the Grizzlies, and yep. then Matisse Thybul is in okay. is in is on the plane like to to my right. And I'm tweeting about it, and Brevin taps me and goes, but what does this mean? I said, I don't know, bro. I'll just tweet what I got, right? <laughs> so we're like, we're talking about it. And then when we get to Vegas, I remember having a conversation with Kobe White. He was like, Scoob, I don't know what the hell this is. He was <laughs> like, it, I just see schedules and dates. And then as you as you peruse that schedule and you have conversations with players, I would say through mid-November to late November, players still didn't know what the hell it was. All they knew was half a million dollars in Vegas. And I don't know if I answered your question, but 
but I also think that that's significant because I feel like they just threw it at you while summer league was going on. And it was something they were advertising, but then people had to grow into it. And I think that was so similar to the, the play in. Yeah, definitely. The only difference is there wasn't a monetary value. It was a chance to make it to the playoffs and a team like the Miami heat took it and ran with it. Hell yeah, they did. So, Quick question. Now, I don't know this. Do they do play in tournaments for basketball in Europe or not playing um, in season tournaments for basketball? Because I know they do them for soccer, but do they do them? Do you know if they do them in the European leagues, like the Turkish league? The I, Spanish I, league? I, I know that there is a level of a tournament, um, but I don't I, I have friends that have played overseas and they've made mention of it. And they said that it's kind of like soccer. I don't know all the ins and outs. I'm the wrong person to ask that. Well, Cause I was curious if like Adam silver and if the NBA went to these other leagues to try and figure out, you know, how they do it to kind of fit it in because like soccer is a little bit easier. They play on the weekends, you know, once a week. And then when you're doing these in season tournaments, you could mix in a game on a Wednesday. So at these regular games, like, so it's not as bad where basketball NBA is played Sunday through Saturday, and it's spring, you know, random off days, back to backs. So it's got to be a little more complicated to do that schedule. So I'm curious if they got feedback from their Euro uh, compatriots. It's possible, but I'll add even before the um the the in season tournament was 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 birthed, you were hearing rumblings about the fact that the NBA would try to have a tournament within a season where. That was separate from regular season play, and then they would take a break. So think of it kind of like college where you show up and you go to class throughout the regular scheduling, and then once there's the last part of classes, then there's midterms or finals, and you don't go to class. That's the concept in my mind. That's that's how I envisioned it, and I think that this was a revised version of it, but I know that this is something that they've wanted to do for a while. And I think that the bubble gave the NBA a myriad of ideas because of how much COVID affected everything without fans. And they had to play those 70 plus games in order for the TV contracts to make sense. And you looked at how people were on, on zoom on those video zooms I think that was a catalyst. I also think that the NBA with taking the logos off of the the shoulder and putting it either on the back or on the shorts, they took, they were, I won't say they took, I'll say they were, they were um, influenced by watching soccer do that with all of the logos there. Yep. Um, The NBA is about their paper and they're going to find ways to expand what it is that they're doing. So I think there's a smorgasbord of different w- things that inspired them. And, and here we are now. Yeah. Well, you know, the NBA, everyone in America is looking up at the NFL in terms of the dollar, right? So the NBA has been, you know, inching closer and closer and they're trying to figure out more ways to get that viewership and they're doing a good job. Cause I think the game right now, they have a ton of superstars to throw around. So they're doing well. So the last thing I want to talk about for the in-season uh, tournament, there was an obvious hangover with the Lakers and Pacers after that championship game. I think the Lakers went like one and six after that. I think the Pacers went like, oh, and five, like there was an obvious hangover there. Is there anything the league you think can or should do to maybe prevent that from these teams? Like, to, cause it kind of wasn't a reward. They got done playing that championship game. I think they maybe had two days off and then they resumed. Right. That's, that's a lot of emotion. That's a lot of high level play to like ask these guys to then jump right back into regular season mode. So, do you think there's something that they could or should do to kind of prevent that? Or is this just going to be something where teams are going to get used to it? They're going to get used to the play in the in game in season style. And that's just going to be it. I think they're going to get used to it. And I think for the Lakers, um, a, they had the shortest distance in travel. Yep. B, I think they had an off day that next day. LeBron went to see Bronny play. And C, you're the Lakers, you're LeBron. Those conversations are going to be had. If LeBron farts, it's a, it's a headline. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, I think that, or I believe that 
you know, LeBron and the Lakers aren't just going to are, are not are just not going to win it every year. And that's OK. Oh, yeah. I, I think that. But what I find interesting in that whole Lakers and Pacers matchup at that point was the Lakers were or excuse me, the Pacers weren't doing well. And then Tyrese Halliburton had that quote. Yep. And then they found their way to the in season tournament finals. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great for him and his brand to a national audience yeah. um, at large. I don't know that the league is going to change it because I, I just think you have a certain time frame from October to April in the regular season to get it together. Um, but I also think that because basketball is a year round game, um, who's to say at some point they may consider expanding it so that it is a a, a, a year round sport schedule wise. Um, I think the again the bubble showed you that an NBA Finals in September is not unfathomable. Unfortunately, I don't want to I don't want to make light of the reason why that happened. But yeah, I yeah. mean, again, you're inspired by different things you can tinker with. So I mean, and we could be honest, the execs they don't care about the bubble anymore. They don't care about the consequences. They're just looking at their money flow again, and that's all yeah. they're worried about. Yeah, but I, I but I also think that things have just changed. So yeah. I, again, I, I do think that the NBA is considering other things. Like uh, I talked to a player the other day that's that's retired and, and well respected, and he was a fourth round pick in the 1985 draft, and now you're looking at the draft being two days. The draft at large is one of the most time-consuming marathons on a Wednesday where you have pre-draft stuff and then Thursday. Bro, I'll tell you that the draft last year, I literally was on my feet the whole time and was running from place to place and only sat down when I had to do a Zoom interview with another TV network and then I was up running again. To have it for two days, as much as people complain about it, I semi kind of like it. And I think that if that's what they're going to do with the draft, who's to say they won't do something with the scheduling? So the NBA needs to let you set up your boots somewhere over in Barclays, and then you can have people sit down and talk to you at the Scoopy uh, studio. <laughs> That's what I'm calling for, because that, that studio was looking nice. I don't know if, if people haven't seen Scoop's new studio. Go check it out uh, with the podcast and things like that and his interviews. That studio is looking fresh, Scoop. It looks thank fantastic. You, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I want to jump in. Let's go over to the trade deadline. It is next, what is it, next week, the 8th, I believe, is the trade deadline. Yes. So At let's 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Let's get into it. So what are you hearing right now? I know we're still, we're in smoke and mirrors mode. It's a Friday. It's next Thursday. So everything could change from what you say today to tomorrow because I know your the information you're getting right now is fluid right it's always fluid up until the the 11th hour right or whatever of course it's hour. so what are you hearing right now during the trade deadline um who might be available who is looking to be dealt things like that uh, any of the big names Kyle Kuzma Kuzma that's a big one so um where are you thinking what are the what are the rumbling saying that who's interested in Kuz? The Dallas Mavericks have been interested in Kyle Kuzma uh, since about uh, October when the season started. Uh, I spoke to someone in the know, um, and they said to me that um, he he compliments Kyrie and 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 Luca like a glove, yep. um, and he to them is is the the prototypical three and D guy that they would need. Um, and I think he would be a dream on light for them as far as um, playing positions three and four. Um, and they think that he's an underrated defender um, because, and I think because people look at the flashy stuff or just his persona and just think he's a scorer and that's it. Um, they feel like he's tall. Um, he has a connection to Jason Kidd. But ultimately, it's a matter of what they would give up, meaning uh, the, the the Dallas Mavs to the Washington Wizards, because um, the, the the 
Matt, the Wizards are wanting two to three first round picks in any deal uh, circling around uh, Kuz. Um, additionally, um, the Sacramento Kings have interest in him. Um, you know, they're 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 a team that has two All Stars that weren't named All Stars. Uh, ridiculous that one of them, Devonis Sabonis, at a minimum should have been in there because he's a freak. And De'Aaron Fox is uh, he's. Isn't he leading the NBA in uh, scoring right now, 27.7? Yep, he's up there. But yeah. um, And to me, I look at the, the Sacramento Kings, and I call them the Denver Nuggets light yeah. version um, because they, they play similarly. Their, their offense, although they have a speedy guard in De'Aaron Fox, their offense still does in a lot of ways run through Sabonis, yep. um, similarly to how it runs through Jokic. Different styles of big men, but ultimately they do they, they push the ball and they, and they get a lot of scoring. Kuzma would fit that team from a a defensive standpoint, I think, as well as just his offensive ability um, as well. So, you know, Kyle Kuzma is a name that's floated around um, uh, in in my ear. Um, Additionally, his teammate Daniel Gafford of the Wizards is is another person of interest. Um, I'm told that uh, the New York Knicks uh, are interested in, you know, they would have to offer up uh, more than just um, Evan Fournier, and, and, and others, but um, that's a name that I hear a lot. I know the, the, the New Orleans Pelicans as well um, have some interest in Daniel Gafford. They're looking for um, a rim protector and possibly another guard, a name that that, I, that is floated to me. My name is Onyeka uh, Okongu, yep. uh, who's a 6'9", six, 6'10", six, uh, combo power forward and center. Um, and so, so those are some of the, the things that I'm hearing across the league. As far as the Knicks goes, um, and and everything that is Dejounte Murray, um, I know that the Lakers and 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 the Atlanta Hawks are teams that um, pe- many people have 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 hinted could move in that direction. I I don't think that moving uh, D'Angelo Russell for Dejounte Murray at this point in the season makes them better because I think you're going to run into gelling problems similarly to Doc Rivers taking over as head coach of the Bucks. In season, I think there's a lot that goes that should could be said about training camp and, and that and that time frame of, of getting it together. So um, the Knicks are intriguing, but they would have to give up quite a bit um, to get Dejounte Murray. And I don't think you should really break up that Knicks team um, because they're they're clicking on all cylinders. You add small pieces that are assets to your star power. So what about uh, Trey Young? I feel like every single deadline since Trey Young's been in the league, it feels like rumblings of Trey Young being traded are there. And then every year, he's back in a Hawks uniform leading that team. Any rumblings or any serious rumblings of Trey possibly getting moved right now? Nothing serious um, that I've heard. Um, I know that Nate McMillan and, and Trey Young ultimately did clash um, and – it wasn't just Trey Young. It was other members of that locker room that had issues. And then in comes uh, Quinn Snyder, who uh, tells me um, that he loves his time in Atlanta, in Atlanta and, and he really is looking to grow. Um, you know, Quinn Snyder was a guy that was on Atlanta's wish list. They actually called him on vacation with his wife while Nate McMillan was still head coach. And he said, no. Wow. Um, I, I was told that story was pretty funny, but Quinn Snyder definitely um, has the respect of that locker room. And, you know, he has a good supporting cast uh, with his assistant coaches. But um, I, I think that if you trade DeJounte Murray at this point, uh, I think Trey Young could be looking for greener pastures as well. Um, I don't know that the Knicks would be the team. I know that everybody wants, or I won't say everybody, I know that the Nets faithful uh that's a pipe dream for them. Um, I don't know that that is um, fruitful, at least this season. And a lot of times people revisit those things in the off season. I've tweeted this before. Um, and I, and I'll amend a little bit of what I said. I, I said on Twitter that I believe that um, Cam Thomas would fit like a glove on a team like in Atlanta. And I think that if you include a package uh, that would include Cam, if the Nets were looking to move him, that would be a starting point if they're looking to bring in Trey Young. And I don't know that the Atlanta Hawks are looking to totally rebuild right now. I think Trey Young is in a very similar situation in Atlanta with that organization that Carl Anthony Towns is uh, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. 
if Cat were to ask for a trade today, the Timberwolves would honor it. And I think that Trey Young were to ask for a trade in Atlanta, the same could happen there. And I've heard nothing of the sort from either one, from either one of those players. Okay. Uh, you know, I think it would be it would suck for Cat to move right now from Minnesota, considering how hard he's worked for that franchise. And it seems like they're trending in the right direction with Anthony Edwards and him. So part of me really wants to see him stay there and at least give this a really good run, because I think they could be really good going forward. Now, Philadelphia is interesting to me, even with the healthy Embiid, you have him, you have Maxi. I feel like they need something else there to help those two guys out, really, to be a contender to your Bucks and to your other teams in the East, your Knicks and things like that, and Celtics. Are you here in Philly um, looking for anything to make any big splashes right now? I think Zach Levine would fit in Philadelphia. Maybe the only place Zach may fit in because of his style. I love Zach Levine. I think he's a great scorer. He's up there in age. He's a volume shooter at this point. But I do think he would fit in there, especially with the fact that I feel like he'd be cool to be an Embiid's team and just waiting in the wings to make plays. So Yeah, and and I feel like that move that they made for Harden, they got a ton of assets that would benefit Chicago pretty well. Yep. Um and more. I think that's where you, you that fit goes. But again, I've heard nothing. This is only my opinion. Um, but I also know that a team like the Knicks, prior to their streak, it would have fit. Now, no, I don't think you mess with it. I think Philadelphia at this point is a better fit. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I think that when you look at Philly for the long haul, um, depending on how long Embiid is out, um, I, I think bringing in Mobamba was was a great addition uh, for for the for for the you know and be getting older you know but yeah. at the same time I think if they don't make it past the conference finals and into the finals he's gonna start looking around definitely and if I'm Philly I'm preparing for the future also. 100%. I agree with that. Um, so last few here, Donovan Mitchell, if you go on Nick's Twitter, he's been a Nick for the past three years, um, all because he likes the Mets or something like that. I guess that's why he's a Nick, apparently. Any rumblings on Donovan Mitchell being moved? Not recently. Um, you know, Donovan Mitchell almost became a Nick. Yeah. Carmelo oh. Anthony almost came back to the Knicks, and Julius Randle was almost shipped out of here. Yep. So. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. As my mother, my late mother would say, she would say, if my aunt was my uncle, she'd have nuts. So shoulda, coulda, woulda. <laughs> Ultimately, he's still a member of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And, um, you know, they've played good basketball. So yeah. have I heard any rumblings recently about it? No. Um, but I think that the Cavs also need to be a little prudent, too, because I still believe that um, – LeBron will find his way back to Cleveland and we will reunite with his son um, and play in Cleveland. That's going to be interesting if they do, because I mean, once LeBron goes places, he reshapes those teams too. So you're going to see who stays and who goes. So last group I want to touch on, I want to talk about Brooklyn Nets, my favorite team. Um, Obviously, you know, you're a little less biased now, but I still think you're a Nets fan at heart. Um, Brooklyn, uh, Dorian Finney-Smith has been the hot guy saying that a lot of people want to move him. Um, obviously, Cam Thomas is always mentioned. I think Nets fans mention it because there's like, man, go let him go somewhere to get playing time because we're pissed not letting him see, you know, playing 30 plus minutes a game. But what rumblings are you hearing about the Brooklyn Nets? Been quiet. Um, I've, I've had conversations with folks within the Nets organization and they like being young, but they also want to see something in the future come to fruition. I know it's a Knicks fan's dream uh, for Mikel Bridges to join the rest of his Villanova. Uh, stop it. <laughs> folks, but it's been a long time since the Nets and Knicks have made an intrastate or intraborough uh, transaction. The closest we've seen was with Philly and Brooklyn making an intrastate transaction when Ben Simmons and, and, and uh, James Harden were swapped. But, you know, you look at the Nets team, Imagine a world where a lot of those guys were healthy. I, I still think that even if everybody was healthy, they'd still struggle because they're a young team. Um, now, quickly, is there something about the Nets organization? Are they a little paralyzed by what 
they want to see if they could be with a healthy Ben Simmons. Because it seems to me like they're giving Jacques Vaughn a little bit longer leash. We've seen a slew of coaches that just got fired, a few moved in the GM, like front office positions. And, you know, Nets faithful, like any fan base, when it's going bad, we want the coach fired, right? That's how it is. Everyone yells, fire the coach. And, you know, Jacques Vaughn's not perfect, um, but... Do you feel like right now, Shaw Marks uh, inside, they're giving him a longer leash and they're giving this team a longer leash because they want to see what they can be with Ben Simmons at the helm? Or is it just something right now where they're just in wait and see mode, see mode overall? I think they're wait and see mode because I don't think they really know what they want to do. I mean, for me personally, I don't know how Shaw Marks is still employed. I don't know how you get three superstars and lose three superstars in three years and still have a job. I have nothing against Sean Marks, but I feel like in any company, any league, you get that. It's thanks. We're happy with what you did, but we got to do something else because you just chased away a potential mega team. <laughs> One person that I that I that I talk to within that organization says to me that uh, Sean Marks has nine lives uh, because he finds a way to reinvent himself within that organization you know um i think that that nets organization reminds me in some ways of the young team that uh, kenny atkinson had the only difference is they made to the playoffs and they were a competitive bunch yeah. um and that's what i thought they would be at the beginning of this season yep. when um you know they had a a, a a healthy product on the floor um but but ultimately you got to look at the future of Nicholas Claxton because there's a lot of teams that, you know, would go after him. I also look at the trade department and or the trade, the, the trading deadline and the Pelicans are looking for a rim protector. He'd fit like a glove. The yep. Pelicans also have assets. Yep. Be um, you, you look at Cam Thomas and his future. Um, I, I, I don't think people really know his value. Or I, I think some people know his value, know his worth, but I also think that when you look at Cam Thomas and 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 the numbers that he puts up, it to me it reminds me so much of um, Coach Carter. I feel like sometimes Jacques Vaughn is Coach Carter, and Cam is a, a more mature Timo Cruz. He doesn't he doesn't bitch and moan. He doesn't complain, but he's a spark plug off the bench. But he's really a starter. But yep. his role has just been augmented so many times. Yeah. Um, and I think other team, if they're looking to move him for the right price, could appreciate his value. I think a Pelicans team is another team is, is another team that I mentioned. I'd love to see him play for. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, I mean, if the Pels, I. I uh, I just don't want to see Cam Thomas and Clax go because they're two players I love, but I get it. If you're trying to rebuild, and right now the franchise is building around Mikel Bridges. So he's the centerpiece right now of the team. So everything's going around him. So we'll see where they go. Um, but it's going to be an interesting deadline like it always is. Um, I don't expect the Nets to be super busy. I do expect the Knicks to make one more mo more move, and I'll see. I don't know what it is. But I think they're feeling like they're on the precipice of something awesome with uh, Brunson doing what he's doing. And they got to feel like they're in win now mode. Yeah, I, I think that they need a, they need an insurance policy for Julius, because even if he doesn't get the surgery this season, at some point, he's going to have to have it. The good news is he doesn't shoot with his right hand. He's a lefty. Yep. But ultimately, um, you know, other names that are out there like, I think to me, Wendell Carter Jr. would fit on the Knicks team. Now, is Utah looking to move Laurie Markin at all for the right price? Because I feel like Laurie would fit on so many teams. He would fit on so many teams. Laurie tells me he loves it in Utah. Because I feel like him going to either the Nets or the Knicks would be such a great fit for them spreading it out. And I feel like Laurie would do well with what he does because he is a good rebounder, but he also can spread it out. I feel like Putting Brunson and him could be a good combination. I don't think he would fit on that next team. You don't think so? No. I mean, maybe it's just because I like Laurie Markin in general. I feel like he fits. I like him too. I but just don't think he's going to fit. Makes sense. Hey, listen. That, because, you know. because, no, well, listen, he's a dominant scorer as, as a six footer, almost seven footer. Yep. Um, playing in Tim's system. He's going to float a lot, and I think he's going to play out of position. 
because that's Julius because the ball revolves around Jalen Brunson and Julius so much. So you're taking a finesse power forward, if you will, who who is a scorer from the outside and forcing him to crash the boards. He's gonna get hurt. And he's and he's gonna it's it's going to I think you mess up chemistry at this point in the season if you implement somebody like that. Yeah, you know, think about it that way. You make sense in terms of system fits and things like that. You know, that's one thing, especially in the NBA, you gotta look for. It's not just the talent of the player, but it's the system the coach runs. So that certainly makes sense. So let's switch uh we're switching gears here. You talked about, you know, seven footer and Lori Markin, and let's go to, you know, top two dominant uh, center footers, MVP last year, Joel Embiid. Um, obviously goes down. Uh, it's scary. It looks like he might be out for a little bit. Um, a lot of people are blaming this on the rule that players have to play 65 games a year in order to be eligible for any of the awards at the end of the year. Do you like that rule? Do you think that players should be forced to play 65 games if they want to be um, eligible for awards? I'm indifferent, but I, I think I think in the case of um, Joel Embiid, I don't think he cares about winning another MVP. I think we many people want him to care. I, I think at this point, I, I said this on a show earlier today. Um, I had a conversation with Jason Terry last season, um, NBA legend, current assistant coach with the Utah Jazz, and he says he said to me, "Scoop, if you had to pick, if if you're if you're picking for Joel or for for Jokic, who are you, you going with?" And I said, "I think Embiid at last season was the MVP of the regular season, but if I'm Jokic, I don't care because I'm looking to win a championship." What does the regular season award matter? And what happened? Joel Embiid got the regular season MVP and Jokic got the NBA Finals win and the NBA Finals trophy. At this point in his career, Embiid has been there, done that. And I feel like if he doesn't win a championship and he doesn't win an MVP, this whole season is for naught. So if I'm Joel Embiid, I'm resting as much as I can to get ready for the playoffs because last year he was hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't do it, it wasn't it the last two years, like one year he came with the mask on. Yep. And everybody respected his tenacity, but that still didn't produce a win. Yep. In the finals. So I think all this I think he's becoming the poster child for missing games. But ultimately, I really don't even think he gives a damn. I think the fans care about that. And I think that if you're talking about legacy, so what? Charles Barkley won an MVP, had a great career, and top 75 players. But I think at this point, Embiid is trying to win championships. I agree with that. And I think, you know, it's funny because I think we're in a different time in the NBA where our, you know, perennial two leading candidates for MVP are very much indifferent about that, right? Because Jokic is just indifferent about basketball. He's one of the most interesting superstars we've ever seen because I think he does love the game of basketball more than he leads on. I think he hates the press more than anything else in dealing with that side of it. But, you know, it's just interesting with his comments where he's just like, I don't pick up a basketball offseason. I go and I like live my life. And then you have Embiid, who has said constantly, like, listen, regular season don't mean nothing to me. Um, you know, I'm trying to get a chip here. I'm trying to bring a chip to Philly. So it's it's a different place, I think, that we've been where I think a lot of guys will definitely say, like, hey, I'm only going for championship, but they want those accolades because they're trying to build a legacy. But I think we have it's weird that we have two guys that have been leaders for the MVP race are just pretty much indifferent to all this stuff. Their eyes are quite literally on the championship prize. Have you ever, you know, maybe outside of like Michael was very much that way because Michael knew what he wanted, but uh, have there, have we had a situation where we've had this many like top guys that kind of just don't care about that regular season champ, uh, award? No, but I think, I think that year, one year LeBron got it. I think Derek, another year Darren Rose should have gotten it. Um, and I also think that as much as people did, like, uh, so I, f- I feel like, like in politics, there's a two party system, the independent, while like, unless Mark Cuban runs as an independent, nobody's going to pay attention to that, that third candidate in the same breath. 
I think people have made up in their mind that it's either Jokic or Embiid. And I feel like there are other candidates for the MVP that then they don't get it because of Regency bias. I think Shea Gilgis Alexander is playing his ass off and his team has been in the top one or two all season so far. I think Anthony Edwards has played his ass off. I think he should be in the conversation. I also think um, that Jalen Brunson should be oh, in that yeah. conversation. And if you don't give him the MVP, is he in, is he in the running for most improved player of the year? Like, where 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 do we fit that? And we mentioned Demonis Sabonis. Demonis Sabonis can absolutely with you know doing what they're doing over there. They're playing well. He's but you know, player. but but I mean, he wasn't even voted as an All Star. Not He's not with Tier Fox. So I, I think you know, in the, in the Northern California region, they pay attention to the Warriors. Yeah. Win, yeah. lose, or draw. And you know, I guess there's something to be said. The Warriors earn that, right? Because of their dynasty, so they kind of earn that press. And as long as Steph Curry is there, they're going to pay attention there. So, um, you know, last question with the whole Embiid thing: Is there a difference between today's player and in terms of wanting or needing that rest time a little more with the way the game is a lot faster in the way they run a lot more because it's a lot more get up quick, get that three up. A lot, you know, a lot of teams are in that D'Antoni style very much more now than they used to be. Where you know, back in the day, it was much more of a grind it out, get down low key, more of a physical game. Is there a major difference in terms of needing rest days now than there used to be back in the day? I think players are more concerned about their bodies, and and there's more information about diets and rest uh, than. Back then, I mean, I, I, I was talking to a player, rec- a retired player recently, and he was telling me about how, like, in the 80s and 70s, there'd be beer in the locker room for players to drink. At halftime, after games, people would be smoking cigarettes. We've come a long way since that. And so I think, you know, Players are more conscientious about their bodies, but I also think players are playing more with the, <clears throat> to be more injury prone. And I also think a lot of players in today's league, um, their bodies are a lot more, their bones are a lot more brittle. And I think that there are, there are, without naming names, there are certain sports drinks that 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 affect that they drink that affect their bones and make them more brittle as well. You think they also play too much basketball? Do you think they play too much? They're playing too much year round. A lot of these guys, because we always see off season videos of guys running pretty hard, like you know, playing. Um, what's that place over in Cali that a lot of players play? It's um, I forget the name. The Mamba Academy. Mamba Academy. There's another. Are you talking one. about the Rico Ryan, the Rico Hines run at UCLA? Uh, yeah, I think that, and it's like, and you just see a lot of videos of players all off season still playing hard, hard pickup games, you know, things like that, and. Do you think they just play too much now where I think guys back in the day when it was the off season, it was the off season. They were spending time with their family. They were going on vacation. They were, you know, working out, but not playing ball. I think think there's something to that. I think that 24 hour news coverage gives you the perception that they're playing all the more and that players were, were, were just spending time with their family. I, I think, I think, um, like I take it back to, when Michael came out of retirement, Charles Barkley has told me this story and a, f- and a few other people have told me this story about how <clears throat> Michael had that Space Jam dome in California while he was while he was preparing for um while, while he was preparing for the season and everybody and their mama and their mama's mama was there. Queen Latifah was hanging out there. Shaq was hanging out there. Dennis Rodman, Jawan Howard, a lot of people, Penny Hardaway. Basketball is a year round sport and people are always playing. Um, I, I just think that the internet has given you the indication that it's always going on. And I also know that a lot of times videos are released and that doesn't necessarily mean it's happening when we see it. That's true. That is, that is very Um, true. Yeah. The internet's tricky with that. I think that ultimately um, this is what you signed up for. I think that, well, I remember being around the league where, when the lockout season, the first lockout season happened, where some play, some teams would be playing four or five nights a week. And sometimes their back-to-backs would be like one night Seattle, the next night Indiana, the next night Orlando. 
That's crazy. And I don't think that the players have it that bad now. Now, this is what I do find interesting. Sometimes schedules kick your butt. I remember in December, I went to a a Sixers-Timberwolves game. And I remember a couple guys on that team were telling me that as soon as the game was over, they had to fly back to Minnesota. They were on their way to the airport because they left Philly and the very next day they had to fly to Minnesota to play against the Lakers at home and then leave Minnesota and fly to LA to play the Lakers, I think two nights later. So they had like a home at home after that? Yeah. After playing Philly and then the next night, no, it was a home and away. Oh. Right? So Philly one night. Minnesota Timberwolves. and Lakers. Yeah. So yeah, that was a home and home. Yeah, yeah. But, but still, yeah, it, that's tough. That's yeah. That's how are you gonna? And I think there needs to be a rule. I was talking to someone about this. You should not be able to play a team on a back to back coming off fresh. A team in a back, like if you're playing a back to back, it should be against another team playing a back to back. You know what I mean? Like so, both teams are now fatigued. We're almost, you know, obviously it won't be equal because every game is going to be different, right? But both teams just got done playing a game the night before. So it would at least make more sense to put them against each other because you see this all the time. You'll see like the Celtics will play a back to back and then, I don't know, pick, you know, a, a team that's not great right now will come and they'll play them and they'll beat them. Why? Because they're freaking exhausted. It don't matter. Jason Tatum and Brown are there and Porzingis. They're beat. They might have had a tough game the night before. So I think there's got to be something to that where they maybe make a rule where you can't play a back-to-back in a fresh team. Like, that's just wrong to me. Right. And then, and then like, I've seen scenarios where, like, I remember one time the Phoenix Suns had been on a whole East Coast swing. And their la- and I think their la- their their last game was against the Nets. This was some years ago. Yeah. And I remember somebody saying to me, "Watch Phoenix lose by like thirty points because they don't give a shit, and it's the last of a home and home, and they're tired." Yep. And they lost by thirty. Yep. And then I think they went home. And I think the previous game they played against Washington and, and beat them badly. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. And then say, for example, the Nets, say they played a home game at that at night. So they're done at 1030. Say they got to play against Chicago. They leave. They get to the airport around one in the morning in central. They get to they go to the hotel. Then they got to get up about 10, 11 o'clock to be to practice at 12, one o'clock. They might have a day off and then they play. People don't account the time zones, the late travel. That goes with that. They just think yep. of the actual game. None of it's easy, and that's why it's a grind. And you know, and like you said, a team that has 82 games is willing to give away that last game of a freaking long trip. Reva, you know, revamp. You got more to play. You got there's 81 more, so it's tough. It's not easy to do, and that schedule is is a grind. That's why. I mean, it's tough. Bottom line. So, last topic I want to jump on you with because you're not just all the game. You're a man of culture. You're a man of style. I want to talk to you about some of the jerseys. Do you prefer the modern designs that we've been seeing with the jerseys, you know, some of the newer logos and some of the, um, you know, uh, the city edition logos and things like that and some of the specialty logos? Or do you prefer kind of more of the old school where you had a little more of your base stuff, you had your home and away, and those those became more iconic because they were consistent? I mean, I, some jerseys I think are ugly as hell. Um, I don't like I, the Nets jersey, the new Nets jersey. I don't like that thing. With the bubbles on them and the different colors? Yeah, I don't like that at all. I think it's creative. I don't like it for a, a jersey, maybe a they, shirt. They've grown on me. Um, I mean, I, I, I have more of an issue with the te- the fact that teams aren't wearing white at home as much anymore. I agree with that. Um, but I also realize that – the same way I may feel that way is probably the same way my parents felt about baggy shorts. We're just it, being old people. That, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I think that that is just things change. Yeah. Um, 
there are some jerseys that are, that, that are out there that, that I like. Um, I like the Lakers, the, the black jerseys, that, and especially when they wear them on matinee games, yep. these designs. Um, I like some of Philly's designs. Um, the Knicks jersey where it says New York twice, it took a while for me to kind of adjust to that. Um it's not my it's not my era. It's my it's my niece and my nephew's era. So I just I just watch the games and roll with it. But something else will happen. It'll change again. There's nothing new under the sun. Um. So do you think that when we see some of these old school jerseys come back, like you know Brooklyn brought back their 1990s jerseys last year, right? The 80s 90s, um, design and their jerseys. And I mean Brooklyn fans ate it up. I have I haven't seen that much. You know, with the Red Nets logo apparel like that since Coleman was playing, right? And I think back then, we liked those jerseys, but, you know, you were in the moment and it was kind of like when they made the switch to the more modern with the Grays and the Jason Kidd era, we were all for that. Do you think we kind of look at these jerseys with some nostalgia, especially, you know, someone, you know, we're, we're older, we saw them, we saw them play in those jerseys. Do you think we look at it with nostalgia and it's not necessarily that they're nicer jerseys. It's just the familiarity that makes us think that they're nicer at times. That kind of goes back to when you, when you said to me, when you asked me about um, players and them playing more basketball and you said that they were playing with their, with their kids or spending time with their family. I think when you're young, you editorialize things I remember them as a kid. Yeah, that's why. No, that's why you could. We couldn't really say anything bad about Michael. Nat. People get surprised when you hear stories about Michael because Michael was so reverenced. I think the same applies for jerseys. They're reverenced, and so that nostalgic perception plays a part in that. Yes, I, you know, I agree. I, even though I still will say the Supersonics jersey and logo was always perfect. I <laughs> they're one that you can't touch. The Sonics are dope, and they need. We still need to bring back our Sonics. Um, I really think that. So, what's your favorite jersey of all time? If I got to put you on the spot, I don't know that I have one. Um, I mean, I like the black uh, and black with the red pinstripe bulls. Um, I liked the Pistons jersey was just the plain Pistons in red with the blue, uh, with the bad boys there, and it led into um, Grant Hill. Yep. Um, I liked the shorts that the Toronto Raptors wore when they first came into the league with the big dinosaur. Those were dope. Um. I liked the Bucks with like the era of Todd Day and and Ray Allen and Glenn Robinson. Those Bucks jerseys with with the with the buck on them. Um, I, I liked it. I, I liked the, the Nuggets with the Lego blocks. The Alex English era Nuggets. Yeah, those were nice. Um, and I liked the Orlando Magic's uh, jerseys when they first came in the league. I, I have a pair of white with the pinstripe, the blue with the pinstripe, and the black with the pinstripe. I think those those stood out. The Shaq era. Uh, I think everyone had those when they were younger. Those were one of the things you just got because they were fresh. Like mm-hmm. those, those magic, that magic style. My favorite will always be the cursive Chicago, where the Chicago was written in cursive, the red with the black cursive. I don't know why I've always liked those jerseys. I just thought they looked nice. <laughs> there they are. They, they, there's a lot to choose from. I, I could go on and on all day. Yeah, you know, some of the classic Spurs jerseys where they had the, you know, the lighter green and the red and all that. I like those too. I thought mm-hmm. those were fresh. So there's always a lot to choose from. And, you know, people might listen to us and think we're crazy, but that's okay. That's the fun yeah. part about clothes, right? Everyone can have their own opinion. Yeah. So before we jump out of here, if for David, David always likes to ask our guests lately a non sequitur question. So I'm going to bring you David's non sequitur. He sent it to me earlier. Would you rather be as cool as a penguin, as royal as a lion, or as graceful as a dove? This is a random one, I know. <laughs> That's probably uh, probably royal as a lion because um, they're a leader. The dove I like because you can fly out of situations, but you can still get caught by a lion. So I think that's why I like the lion. David thought you would go lion. 
He said that he's, he predicted Scoop will go lion. I said cool as a penguin because penguins are my favorite animal. So, <laughs> and they're cool as shit. So, there you go. There you go. Scoop, thank you so much for jumping on. It's always fun with you, brother. Brother, thank you as always for the opportunity to be myself. So once again, he is Brandon Scoopy Robinson, NBA insider, host of Scoopy Radio Podcast. Always has things cooking. Um, go follow him at Scoopy on uh, X, Twix, whatever you want to call it, Twitter, whatever you want to call it now. Um, are you still just at Scoopy on Instagram as well? Yes. I mean, Scoopy's unique. Ain't no one going to steal that from you. And just remember, whenever you see anything that Scoop says, he has no sources. No one told it. He made it all up. Of course. It's fiction. Didn't happen. <laughs> It did not happen. So once again, if you like what you heard today, give us a like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five star, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials at the Alex Cuesta Show. We'll be back next week with another awesome show. Thanks for listening, everybody. So long.